welcome everyone. Uh, it's an honor to have Hillary Pennington here again um, and to give you all a chance to speak with her. Um, when I first met Hillary, she had just founded an organization called Jobs for the Future. Well, if you know the, the current discourse, focus on jobs and the evaporation of jobs for Americans has become a big thing. She saw it 30 years ago uh, and, and decided to work on that kind of problem then uh, and did a terrific job running that organization, so much so that she was recruited to go to the Gates Foundation uh, in a major leadership role at the Gates Foundation for, um, uh, at, from there. Uh, and and as, as if the Gates Foundation was not enough, <laughs> she also was working at the same time, I think, partially with the Center for America Future. Is that right? Set, so, set, uh, set American, before I went to Gates. Before you went American to Gates. Progress, yeah. Right. Um, and then she was recruited back to the, to, not back, to the Ford Foundation and made the czar of all programs at the Ford Foundation. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so we can refer to her as a czarina if you, <laughs> if you would like, but she is much too um, uh, unassuming and, uh, and unpretentious to allow us to call her the czarina, so we won't. Um, and I hope you'll respect my decision in that respect. In that respect, but it is a pleasure to welcome her here. Um, you know, she is known in the foundation world as someone with many ideas, who knows how to focus them, who knows how to get things done by focusing on strategy, and who has, is wonderfully sensitive to the nuances of even the largest foundations, which are faced with many different kinds of problems, and political issues, and mm -hmm. economic issues, uh, and demographic issues, that she somehow manages well. So welcome back. It's thank an you. honor to have you here, and I thank you very much for coming and making time for the schedule today. Oh, well, thank you, Joel. And you know, I just to, to uh, state the obvious that probably every single person who comes in this room says Joel has been an amazing mentor to me and so, so many people um, in the field. And I'm really glad to be back. You know, I always feel I learn more from these kinds of conversations and the kinds of questions you ask, then I, um, then I contribute. So I'm going to try to go through some material in about maybe 20 or 25 minutes and then open it up for sure. uh, a real dialogue back and forth. And I thought um, the most interesting thing to do would be to pick back up and sort of tell you the story of our journey uh, as we try to figure out how do we best modernize ourselves, given that we're an old foundation and the world is changing so much, how do we keep um, making sure that we are um, positioned to have the maximum impact that we can. And I remember Hodding Carter when I was here, the, I think maybe in 2015, it was early in Darren's presidency, and he said something like, you know, that is the most transparent description of a foundation change process I've ever heard, and it's a mess. <laughs> something to that effect. And that was, you know, um, you'll, you'll be the judge of whether we have, uh, we have made progress. But I'm going to uh, just go use a couple of slides as I talk just to ground the work because I think it is a really interesting time to think about how foundations best have impact given the world that we um, inhabit. And we are, a, we are an old foundation. We're 80 years old. We um, have had little outside pressure to change, really no objective standard for, whether to, for how to know whether or not we've actually had impact and no clear accountability to force us to change. Um, we have uh, a mission that has been stable since we began, as you can see there on the, um, on the slide. And we have made um, significant contributions in the world over, our, over the history of the foundation. And some of these are reflected here on the slide, the work we did to end apartheid in South Africa, our support for the Green Revolution, work we did um, early in the, in the evolution of microfinance and the world of self-help uh, in the credit union, one of our great successes as a grantee, Martin Eeks's work, and then work we continue to do on human rights worldwide. Um, but you know, in these tumultuous times, we have had to ask ourselves the question, do we need to change? And if so, how should we change? Um, and in what ways? So I want to walk you through a little bit of the kind of what we're trying to get ahead of. We, as an institution, have generally changed in crisis. Um, and we've generally changed when there's been a sharp decrease in the stock market that has reduced the value of our endowment. So in the 1980s, um, we had an abrupt decline in our assets. 
we precipitously reduce programs and staff. Um, we close eight offices mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, similarly, when the dot-com bubble happened, same kind of a thing, abrupt decline in our assets, great reduction of staff, and a, a very quick pivot in our work on topics. And similarly, again, in 2009, when the, there was the financial crisis. And what you have to imagine as you look at this picture is for every single one of those things, there are fields and, and grantees attached to them. So when a foundation like ours changes precipitously, we do great harm. And so one of the things we are trying to do now, um, seeing how the world is changing and also due to our very um, prescient um, chief investment officer, is to anticipate that the stock market won't continue to go up. <laughs> it will go down again in some um, concrete time. And so how do we get ahead? How do we plan in a more intentional way for change? And um, as we do that, we've been talking a lot and looking a lot at our, th our own theory of impact. It's not that different than most foundations. We make an impact because we have grants, despite the fact of our grantees saying, oh, it's, your val it's all the value you give us above the grant. It's the grants uh, to support ideas and individuals and institutions. We also are an institution that historically has invested a lot in the expertise of our staff and the networks that our staffs bring. And then um, our brand, the fact that we have a legacy. We have a long reputation and experience. We have strong relationships with governments in, pla in places all around the world, and a long history of partnerships. And this model means that we are also somewhat more expensive in our overhead than, than some of the new entrants into the philanthropic marketplace. We, you know, there's a rule that you're not supposed to go above the 80-20 um, rule, 20% of um, spent on yourself, your own operations as a foundation, 80% on grantees. We are about at that, a little bit less than 20%, and we're comfortable being there, although it's at the high end of the spectrum, because of our theory of impact. Um, so we have 10 offices around the world. We don't plan to change that. Um, but it does mean, because like any organization, most of our expense is staff. We have to take cost out of our model every year in order to just stay even, especially if the stock market and the endowment go down. Um, so where, you know, where are we and what are the forces that we are trying to take into account? The first um, cause for change is a huge, huge disruption that's happening globally. And for a foundation that works on social justice and human rights, it is existential. Um, let's see if I... Uh, you know, we have seen and we all see this every day in our country, but in, ev you know, in every country where the Ford Foundation has offices, whether it's Brazil or China or India or Egypt, <laughs> a growing entrenchment of the drivers of inequality, which fracture societies and erode global norms that have kept a liberal order in place since the foundation started, the rise of populism and extremism, increasing competition um, over what are the best ideas for helping people thrive. You know, China. Uh, could give democracy a run for its money when you look at how it has improved outcomes for people living in poverty. And so um, it is no longer the case that democracies um, necessarily correlate with greater equality, with rising incomes, with reductions in poverty. And, and we are entering a time when there will be, I think, a lot of competition for how best to organize societies to make people's lives better. Oops. And then finally, you know, a global retreat from dialogue on human rights abuses, the rule of law, and democratic values. So that's a big disruptor uh, in the external environment of the foundation. Uh, but also the global land landscape of philanthropy itself has been disrupted or has changed a lot. If you look at the 1960s when we really got started, there were a handful of big foundations. More came online, and forgive us for not having Atlantic on there, uh, in the 1980s, um, anonymous. Uh, and, and today, you know, this is just a handful of the foundations that exist in the United States, and it doesn't even touch Chinese, India, uh, all the other philanthropies that have come online. So this is an advantage for us, because it means that we don't need to do everything, uh, and we can look at how these foundations are focusing and uh, work on things that are harder, um, that are harder to adapt, and, and I will talk a little bit about that in a minute. But what is also true for us is that all around the world, we used to be both welcome and protected in every country where we were. And not only are we no longer that, but we are very much part of the story that repressive governments are trying to tell, that any activity in their societies that is to advance human rights is a Western uh, a plot. 
uh, that all of the um, civil society organizations are funded by the West and run by elites. And so we have seen in, the, in literally um, the le since 2016, um, we were forced, we were stopped from making any grants in India for over a year and forced to register with the government in a way we hadn't been before. The passage of very, very um, strict laws about the NGO sector in China, a new and Russia, and Russia and Egypt, Indonesia, where we have, uh, so um, in both China and Indonesia, we have to give the government a list of every grant we plan to make in the year um, before we make it, um, Egypt too. So it's a very, very different operating environment for foundations in general, but particularly for foundations that work on the kinds of issues that we do. So implications for our theory of impact, challenges to every single one of the dimensions that we have thought of um, for how we construct uh, our work. So we've made a couple of key decisions in light of all of these changes. The first one, is to really align all of the work we do around the singular challenge of inequality. And that's very different than where Ford started out. We worked, we used to work a lot on issues of poverty. And that meant we funded things like education, like asset development, like housing, like workforce development and jobs. But our diagnosis as we look at where the world is today is to say that um, Continued work and improvement has happened in each of those systems while the 1% or the 10% have pulled away from the rest. And that the big problem um, that we should be focused on uh, has to do with the, the concentration of power and money uh, that undercut democratic decision making. And so we've made a shift to focus more on inequality all around the globe. We still have an aspiration to be an effective and, and high impact foundation. So I want to talk a little bit about what it means for us to work on um, the issue of inequality. Um, how do we understand it? What does it mean to work on something like that that is so big and so amorphous? So the first thing that we did as we made the decision in 2015 to shift our focus was to spend a lot of time um, really from the bottom up of the foundation asking each of the staffs in each of our regional offices, including in the US, to think about how inequality manifests itself and works in their societies. And what is it that not only cause, causes it, but keeps it perpetuating itself. And out of all the sort of bottom-up work that we did, we synthesized uh, a diagnosis of five drivers of inequality. And it's these drivers that our program work now is working to try to disrupt. So the first is cultural narratives that are used to justify exclusion and prejudice and discrimination. The second is unequal access to government decision making here in the US but elsewhere. The third is persistent prejudice and discrimination um, against all kinds of dimensions of identity for human beings. The third is rules of the economy that magnify unequal opportunity and, and don't create a level, a level playing field. And the last one is the failure uh, of society and government to invest in and protect vital public goods like education, like the environment. So we took those drivers uh, of inequality, and um, as a result of them, we have made a set of choices about how to focus our work. And I'm going to just walk you pretty quickly through five of those choices, just to give you a, a sense of the choice making in one um, foundation. So the first is, you know, given that there are so many new entrants into philanthropy, like the Gates Foundation, where the people who come into those come into uh, Philanthropy are very, very interested in models and, and interventions that will solve problems. We made the judgment that we don't need to focus on that as much as we did in, um, throughout the earlier parts of the foundation's history. And that it, as, um, instead keying off of some, uh, a very profound set of work done by Danella Meadows on systems change, we should focus on what we call internally our social justice bridge, which is really these four things. So the first, changing the rules of the game. This means that we don't work on things like financial literacy. For example, we work on predatory lending. Uh, changing systems. You do work on predatory lending. We did use, we, I'll did? get to. Okay. We, um, but it's, so it's an yeah. example of just the difference right. between um, the two. The second is really systems change and the goals that systems set for themselves. And there, I'd, I'd say the best example of that is the work we're doing now on mass incarceration and the criminal justice system. But the last two are edgier and they're harder for a lot of foundations to work on. Um, they are changing power dynamics and uh, changing beliefs, really working on the cultural narratives and stories that we tell ourselves. 
And um, I'll read you a quote from one of our grantees, Oxfam, uh, about the importance of power dynamics. So the powerful aren't simply waiting to be better informed by civil society before they voluntarily make things fairer. Um, so w a lot of what we have been doing is funding a, a great many of the movements that are apparent here in the US and around the world. We fund Black Lives Matter, we fund the Dreamers, we have a major investment in next generation leadership, young people who are organizing in different ways to um, improve their society. And while that is risky grant making, uh, we feel like it's a really important place for Ford to be. And then in the changing beliefs, a lot of our work um, now is, is having to do with um, the narratives that people uh, tell themselves. We do a lot of work with, grant make, with um, grantees to try to help them work on storytelling, including to some extent with Hollywood and the people that are, that are the writers um, in shows that are ubiquitous in the culture. Um, we, in early phases of our, li of our um, history, inve invested a lot in developing evidence for models and what works and what doesn't work. And we've seen that models alone and evidence alone don't convince policy policymakers to change things. Uh, another um, one of our grantees working on changing beliefs is the Color of Change, which has done really, really impressive efforts to pressure uh, companies and, and uh, Hollywood to make, to make changes. So that, that's an example of how we've begun to shift um, our work. And doing that um, means we are the kind of funder that stays invested for the long haul. But one of the biggest struggles for us is what does that, what does that mean? And how do we keep the flexibility to pivot and to work on new things when we need to? So in the process of uh, the work that we've done, we look back over our, our own history. And what is clear if you look at how Ford has, has worked is that generally, and this slide shows you some of the issues that we've worked on, we tend to be early, and we have tended to be early entrants into a field where we've backed a leader with a good idea. Gloria Steinem in Ms. Magazine, Mohammed Yunus, Martin Eeks. And then we stay with that idea until a field develops around that idea. And by a field, I mean lots of organizations that are doing things on the issue, common language and a common way of understanding that issue, uh, and other funders. And generally, um, our work, looking back at our, our history and work that others like Bridgespan have done, suggests that you know, it's about 20 years before a field begins to grow up around an idea where there's an ecosystem of actors that are working on that idea. But the hard thing for us is that the issues aren't fixed by the time the field has developed. So in a number of the recent pivots we've made to leave our work on predatory lending and housing and education, we um, have faced a lot of pushback from, from those fields because the job isn't done. And to have a seminal funder who has been so important to creating the field leave it is a really hard thing. But our belief is that if we can apply this criteria, we need to do a better job of narrating our own um, thinking. Um, it, freeing up resources should allow us to do again and again what we've done throughout our history, which is to go where new things are emerging. So examples of new things we're working on with the dollars we've freed up by making some exits are privacy and surveillance and internet freedom. Um, here in the US and all around the world, or the work that we are doing on, um, on discrimination and prejudice. So uh, that's the second choice. First choice, social justice bridge, work on power, culture. Second choice, keep flexibility that will allow us to uh, make pivots when we need to. The third choice, and, that, and so that has resulted in um, basically the program structure of the Ford Foundation today. There's not a linear relationship between the drivers of inequality and each of these things. These drivers affect each other. Um, but there is a strong kind of relationship that's deliberate between the, the ways we constructed our program areas and these drivers of inequality. So if you went to our website, you would see uh, these programs there. Um, but the, fifth, the third choice we've made is to really double down on institutions through an investment that we've made called BUILD. And this is a major commitment that we made starting in 2015 to um, invest a billion dollars over a five-year period in uh, strengthening institutions and organizations. Um, the theory is organizations are critical to the success of social justice movements, particularly because social justice um, is really the long game. For every win you have on a set of issues, there's a pushback against that win. You know, power doesn't give itself up 
easily. And if key grantees that are central in the fight uh, against social justice are having to wait for um, unpredictable funding uh, and whether or not a funder thinks something is important rather than having predictable resources they can plan around, they can't do their work. And one of the best examples of this is um, the work that the ACLU did right after the, tr the first Trump um, instructions came out about uh, immigration. And they were able to bring a lawsuit themselves over a weekend. Um, they were able to do that because they had flexible money that allowed them to skate ahead of the puck. And our basic belief is our grantees know way better than we ever will um, how to do that. And we should be supporting them to become more durable and more resistant and re more resilient but hopefully not more, um, not more dependent. Um, and uh, that it is not just doing that for individual organizations, but also the network that exists between organizations. So we make about 1,200 grants a year. We will, over the life of our build initiative, probably invest in a build-like way in about 300 organizations. So it's not for everyone, much to the great disappointment of every nonprofit organization that is out there that thinks this would be the perfect kind of funding for them, and of course it would be. Um, what we are doing with uh, our, the, our key grantee organizations, we have a critique of what a lot of philanthropy has done over the last 10 or 12 years, which is to invest in, quote, rocket fuel to help organizations grow or scale. We feel that what that has systematically done is to discourage organizations from focusing on the bottom of the pyramid making sure they have enough money to pay people decent salaries, making sure that they really fully recapture their overhead costs, um, making sure that they're able to fund mission-critical capabilities like communications. So one of the most interesting conversations with grantees as we've started the build has been like, no, no, actually, we're not kidding. <laughs> we don't want you to expand. We really, really do want you to spend the money on building up cash reserves and, um, and figuring out succession Change. plans. And that has been an unusual conversation. We made the build decision um, in a very top-down way, which is uncharacteristic for Ford. We decided it as a leadership team, and we told the program teams that they had to spend 40% of their dollars, their grant dollars, on build-like investments. So essentially, we were taking away their ability to invest in short-term project grants and requiring them to think in a very different way. And that was really, really, really not popular as we began. But as we looked at our own history, we had been telling ourselves um, a myth. We characterized ourselves as a great funder who stayed with grantees for multiple year relationships, which was true. Mm -hmm. We just did those multiple year relationships in one year grant. <laughs> and then the next year, another one year grant or two year grant. So if you were the executive director of that organization, you couldn't with confidence hire a new team or plan um, for your future. So we were not, in fact, being good partners in the ways that we thought we were. But it was a hard thing to take the control out of the program officer and put it uh, in the hands of the grantees. So we, the, each of these is a five-year commitment to each of these um, organizations. And at first, it was really hard to win people over. But I would say now, um, BUILD is something that is wildly believed in by our program officers, because for the first time, shamefully. They're having conversations with organizations and executive directors about the whole organization. What keeps you up at night? How does our grant funding affect the broader set of things you're trying to accomplish? Um, we, of the 220 organizations we have funded so far, 120 of them all across the world are led by women, and that's by intention. So we're also trying to skew um, support to build up a certain kind of leadership. Many of them are also led by people of color. Uh, interestingly, since we, uh, organizations have gotten their build grants, so far, um, 29, over 10% of them, a long-standing leader or executive director has said, I can retire now. And so we're finding a very um, surprising number of leadership transitions happening in these organizations. And of those 29 um, founding leaders who are retiring, 24 of the, of the new leaders that are going to take their place are young, rising leaders of color. So it's, you know, it's a different kind of a dynamic um, that this build relationship is creating, which is a very, very uh, good thing. And other funders are starting, our great concern is would other funders come in behind us to fund more in this way, and would they continue to fund these organizations? Our, grant, our build dollars are not actually large. They're not transformational. In fact, we 
they kind of feel like they're too small. But other funders are coming in um, behind them. We got a call um, the other day from Nick Turner, who runs the Vera Institute, which is a really important criminal justice organization. And the Bombers had just called him to say, we're going to give you $25 million for five years because Ford did the due diligence, and we trust that you would be a good grantee for our support. So we're hoping that this will start to catalyze more things like that, and that for foundations that are new and don't ever want to build up a big staff, the fact that we can have these kinds of developmental relationships with these kinds of organizations can mean there's other people that will help them scale. So I um, am going to just skip quickly over the global work we do and not go into great detail mm -hmm. about it, because I'm assuming probably you'd be a little bit more interested in the US-based work. But suffice it to say, we have had 10, we have 10 regional offices that have worked very much in each of their places like community foundations or regional foundations. They have funded um, work driven by their local context. And we've made a decision together with them over the last few years that because the forces of repression are really using a global playbook, uh, we would be better off if each office is willing to give up some of the freedom that it has had and to program on some things together aiming to have impact both locally in their place and on global, um, global rules, global um, uh, norms. So we're focusing on three issues, civil society, um, equitable benef uh, harvesting the benefits and reducing the costs of extracting natural resources, which is the source of wealth for most developing economies, and um, patriarchy. Uh, but the um, lever or the entry point we're using is violence against women and girls because until and unless women and girls are safe in school, at work, in transit between school and work, they will never be able to fully contribute economically or politically um, in society. So we can talk more about what those changes mean, but that's, that's the last piece of the sort of change, uh, w the ways in which a focus on inequality has caused us to change our programming. Um, we have a strong set of beliefs about who we fund in the Global South. We tend to fund very small um, indigenous organizations. The Foundation Center did a recent study showing that of the large amount of money that is um, spent in the Global South by U.S. foundations, only 12 percent goes to Global South organizations. The rest goes to INGOs, inter big international um, organizations like Oxfam, and to Global North organizations, universities. So we're the opposite of that and hope, again, that we can help be finding and um, lifting up and strengthening uh, organizations that others would then um, support as time goes on. <coughs> so all of this is sort of the changes in what we do. And I've tried to sort of explain why we've made those changes and what some of the implications are. But it also, these changes have a big um, influence on how we do our work. And I thought I would just end by walking you through what some of those have been before we open it up for conversation. So, you know, Darren, who you have heard speak as well, has a strong belief that change starts at the top and it starts with the board. So um, our board has changed a lot in the five years of Darren's presidency. It's a 14-member board. Um, there's one white man on it. Uh, we just voted in Chuck Robbins, so now there will be two as Thurgood Marshall Jr. Um, cycles off. But it's half women, half men, and a very large um, number of people of color. And it just means that's just who they are. That's who we are. And the kinds of conversations that happen around the board table and the kinds of values that the institution has are very much affected by, their, by, by our board. And that is not common of most boards, of most foundations um, in philanthropy today. Um, we have also changed a lot. We, we've set up two cross-cutting organizational functions that we never had before. One is an Office of Strategy and Learning. We never had that at the Ford Foundation in any way that has ever stuck, which is kind of <laughs> really hard, uh, extraordinary. But we now have a focus on, on strategy, on learning, on evaluation that is more uniform. Um, and that, that office works with all 17 of our teams, our 10 regional offices, and our seven US-based program teams. And then we have a build team. And the build team is a handful of people who uh, have a great deal of knowledge about organizational capacity, organizational development, and effectiveness. And they, too, work with all 17 teams. So we have a built-in um, unifying, uh, cross-pollinating kind of a structure. But probably the very biggest changes that we have had 
um, you know, we have, we have shifted from an organization that built fields to an organization that is more, more organized around solving problems. Um, we have more targeted objectives than Ford has generally been comfortable having in, uh, in our past, and that's been a hard journey for people. Uh, we have a stronger commitment, as I mentioned, to learning and assessment, and um, we think that a lot of the change that we accomplish doesn't have to do just with grant making, but um, work we do and value our program officers add beyond the grant. This has been a very big change in jobs for directors and jobs for program officers. So Ford would have been on the extreme, if you were putting a spectrum of foundations, towards highly independent, highly authorized program officers who really operated more like faculty. Um, they each had their own program strategy with a pretty tiny budget. They came in, they wrote a program officer memo, memo and then they did what they wanted for the next five to ten years of their tenure. And over the last five years, we have shifted into grant-making teams. So our program officers work together um, on a grant-making team on a shared strategy, and they bring their different expertise towards pooling um, their knowledge and their grant-making uh, to work on a, a shared problem. And similarly, um, our directors, even if we look at the, um, well, I'm, I think I'm going to just skip these last two slides. They're kind of down in the weeds. Um, but, but it's, been, um, it's been a huge, huge cultural change. It means that people that we hire as directors, we are no longer just looking for the biggest expert in a field who may or may not be a good manager. You can't be a director at Ford unless you are both knowledgeable in your field and um, curious about, interested in, enthusiastic, and good at leading a team of people and motivating them to work together. And then the program officers, you know, as I was mentioning, used to focus on funding projects, are now much more focused on building institutions, which changes their relationship to their grantees and the skills that they need to have. Uh, we're still working to, towards fewer and larger grants because um, Ford ha has a history of making a lot of very small grants. Um, but we're trying to avoid the sort of fallacy of the big bet um, and just understanding that if we, we support fewer organizations better, they will have a better uh, chance for impact. And then working, um, really seeing each of our offices, including the U.S., as, as nodes in a global network uh, who are working in shared ways on drivers of inequality that operate globally. So long uh, overview of a lot of change in a very um, well-established uh, well-established foundation, um, and I think with that, I'll stop Absolutely here. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, first question is, have you found other foundations that are willing to come in and partner with you the way you've been able to do in the past? Yes, so that, is the, that was the fifth change that I forgot to say. So yes, <laughs> we, um, we are very, very focused on collaboration with other, with other funders. You know, for the big systems that we focus care about, no foundation can solve those um, by themselves. So we are spending a lot of time and energy on um, collaborative work with funders. Some um, are things like uh, CLUA, which is uh, the Climate Land Use Alliance. Five different foundations by pooled resources have, you know, 50 to $60 million to spend each year on a set of issues, whereas by ourselves we would have way less than that. But Darren also has a big focus on trying to attract at least a subset of newly wealthy people who are entering philanthropy to become more comfortable with working on social justice kinds of issues. So the great iconic example of that is what Ag Agnes Gund right. did by selling her Lichtenstein one painting for $150 million for one painting and setting up a $100 million fund called Art for Justice that's working on criminal justice um, reform. So that's a really exciting, uh, exciting change. And then we're working with Blue Meridian, and uh, we're in the process of setting up a number of, of new funder collaborators. What are, you, what are you doing with Blue Meridian from your side? We haven't announced it yet, but um, we I won't are. Tell anybody. It's okay. Well, I'll just tell <laughs> twenty of my uh, closest friends. It's 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 a major initiative on criminal justice. Oh, um, good. Again, so uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, Blue Meridian is a project uh, or, or an entity an initiative sponsored by the Edna McConnell Crawick Foundation, which has raised a lot of money from individual, individually wealthy individuals plus some foundations to pilot uh, solutions to problems, giving the money to organizations that have already demonstrated the capacity to achieve significant 
impact. Basically. And the thing that we are experimenting with them, they, they tend to have funded um, direct service organizations yes. to scale their impact once they have an evidence base of um, effect. What we'll, we will be trying to do together is to fund um, advocacy organizations. That's so right. to ask the question, ca can you scale impact? Uh, so, you know, organizations like Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative, Vera Institute, um, and others. And um, because changing, again, you know, power dynamics, systems, rules of the game require a different right. kind of approach. So that's learning both for them and for us. Oh, that's terrific. And it's taken a little while to get the funders comfortable. Well, it sounds like you're also getting involved more in advocacy mm -hmm. um, because how better, how can you do it any better than that in achieving the change? Yeah. You need to persuade others. I do. And, um, exactly. and I just want to say how deeply grateful I am. Very stimulating. I had no idea of, of, the, of the details of what we <laughs> talk about. And now I think I have a clearer idea of the details. Um, and I look forward to watching very carefully. I, I've watched the Ford Foundation through a number of different stages. Yes, you have. Uh, for the last 40 years. And so I'm really curious to see how this is going to go. In some ways, it's reminiscent of what it was before, and in some ways, mm -hmm. it's radically different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess that's a good thing, actually. But, but, I, but mainly, I want to thank you for coming. Oh, just thank you for having me. Great pleasure to have thank you. Thank you. It was, it was really wonderful.